In this series of videos, my aim is to explain and illustrate current understanding of the most fundamental aspects of the science of colour, especially the basic attributes or dimensions of colour and their physical and biological basis. People have lots of different opinions about colour, but in these videos I'll be concerned with the opinions embodied in the terminology of the International Lighting Vocabulary, published by the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, or CIE for short. The CIE was founded in 1913 and is the organisation responsible for the international coordination of lighting related technical standards. In relation to colour, the CIE established the framework of modern colorimetry or colour measurement in the first decades of the 20th century, various colour spaces used in colour management and colour technology, including C-Lab, familiar as the lab space in Photoshop, variously mathematically defined standard light sources such as CIE Illuminant D50, D65 and so on, various formulae for quantifying colour differences, and ongoing research into mathematical models to predict the colour appearance of a given stimulus under different conditions. The CIE International Lighting Vocabulary, now available online, gives definitions for more than 1400 terms and is by far the most comprehensive and authoritative source on the scientific terminology of light and colour. These videos will draw on material covered on my website, The Dimensions of Colour, and in my chapter on colour spaces in the forthcoming Rutledge Handbook of Philosophy of Colour. In this first video, I'll look at the most fundamental question of all, what is a colour? When I perceive a light or an object to be red or white or green, I have the impression that this colour is a property of the light or the object. But what is not immediately clear is whether this red or white or green colour is a property of the light or the object that my visual system directly detects, or whether it is the way in which I perceive a property of the light or the object, a way of perceiving that property that my visual system creates. While the first alternative is sometimes called by philosophers the common sense view of colour, scientific consensus is firmly with the second alternative. Elements of this scientific view of colour can be traced back to antiquity via Descartes and Galileo but began in substantial detail with Sir Isaac Newton's researches into the physical basis of colour. Newton showed that sunlight is physically divisible into rays that when isolated appear strongly coloured, but when mixed in various combinations appear strongly coloured through various degrees of whitishness to white. In this well-known passage from his Optics of 1704, Newton explicitly distinguishes between colour as what he calls a sensation residing in the sensorium or mind and colours in the rays and in the object, meaning those properties of lights and objects that dispose them to stir up these sensations. Newton says, and if at any time I speak of light and rays as coloured or endued with colours, I would be understood to speak not philosophically and properly, but grossly, and according to such conceptions as vulgar people in seeing all these experiments would be apt to frame. For the rays to speak properly are not coloured. In them there is nothing else than a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that colour. For as a sound in a bell or musical string, or other sounding body, is nothing but a trembling motion, and in the air nothing but a motion propagated from the object, and in the sensorium tis a sense of that motion under the form of sound, so colours in the object are nothing but a disposition to reflect this or that sort of rays more copiously than the rest. In the rays they are nothing but their dispositions to propagate this or that motion into the sensorium, and in the sensorium they are sensations of these motions under the forms of colours. So for Newton, colour in the light is the disposition of the light to evoke this or that sensation of colour in the mind, 
and he showed experimentally that for an isolated light this disposition depends on the balance or what he called the common centre of gravity in his colour circle of the number of rays in each part of the spectrum. Here the small circles labelled P, Q, R and so on represent unequal amounts of light from the seven spectral bands having their common centre of gravity at the point labelled Z. We would now call this distribution of energy through the spectrum a spectral power distribution, that is, a spectral distribution recorded in terms of the energy of the component wavelengths. An imbalance in the spectral power distribution relative to white light creates a disposition for an isolated light to appear a certain hue and saturation. The direction around the circle of the imbalance, towards Y here, is the property that evokes a perception of hue, such as red or green, or in this case orange, and the size of the imbalance, the distance OZ here, is the property that evokes a perception of what we now call saturation, or in Newton's words, the fullness or intenseness of the colour, that is, its distance from whiteness. Here, a moderate imbalance directed towards the orange evoking part of the spectrum creates a disposition for the light to appear whitish orange. Or in other words, whitish orange as a colour of light is the way in which we perceive a moderate imbalance in the spectral power distribution in the direction of the orange evoking part of the spectrum. Notice that here Newton speaks of all the colours in the given mixture, just as many educators still do today when they say that white light contains all the colours of the spectrum. But Newton made it clear that when he speaks this way, he is speaking not philosophically and properly, but grossly. A light that contains only a single ray or wavelength falls on the circumference of the circle and so has the greatest imbalance possible in that direction resulting in a disposition, Newton says, to appear intense and florid in the highest degree, that is, at the maximum saturation possible for that hue, in this case spectral orange. In saying that the rays to speak properly are not coloured, Newton's insight was that this orange colour is a perception located in the mind of the observer. It is the way in which we perceive this ray when it is not mixed with other rays. Tempting though it is to think or say so, there is no reason to suppose that the orange colour is located in the ray itself, or is located anywhere when a mixture of this ray with other rays evokes a different colour perception. When the wavelengths are present in the similar balance to daylight, their commoner centre of gravity is at the centre of the circle, creating a disposition for the light to appear white or achromatic. To speak properly, such a light does not contain all the hues of the spectrum, as my multicoloured spectral distri distribution rather misleadingly suggests. It has a disposition to evoke no hue. Newton's circle implies that most colours of light can be evoked by many different combinations of wavelengths having the same centre of gravity. This whitish orange light is an unequal mixture of wavelengths from all parts of the spectrum but we should be able to evoke an exactly matching colour with an unequal mixture of just two wavelengths that appear orange and cyan blue in isolation, or just two wavelengths that appear orangish red and bluish green in isolation, and there are innumerable other possible combinations of two, three or more wavelengths. A colour perception such as whitish orange tells us nothing about the specific wavelength composition of a light, only the overall balance of its spectral power distribution. Specific wavelength composition is not a perceivable property of light. Colours are not wavelengths. Some science communicators, especially from a physics background, are inclined to say that our visual system is fooled or tricked when we perceive different mixtures of wavelengths as the same colour. This assumes that our visual system was supposed to detect and identify the individual wavelengths present and failed. But who says that our visual system is supposed to do this? Even approximately monochromatic light is quite uncommon in nature. Detecting individual wavelengths, so important for a physicist, is unimportant for survival.
Newton showed that what we perceive as the colour of an isolated light is the overall balance of its spectral power distribution considered as a two-dimensional system. We now understand that this two-dimensional character is not a physical property of light, but is a product of the human visual system's three receptor types processed in an opponent fashion. Such a system allows us to distinguish a two-dimensional circuit of directions of imbalance towards long, middle, short, or long and short wavelengths. In contrast, an organism with just two receptor types can only distinguish two directions of imbalance towards long or short wavelengths. Opponent processing, opponent processing also explains why an even balance of the three wavelength components is perceived as an absence of hue rather than as three simultaneous hue sensations as we might expect from the way our hearing works. Our visual system does not detect hue and saturation as such in light. It detects variations in the balance of the three wavelength components, which we perceive as variations in hue and saturation. Different spectral distributions match in color when they evoke the same relative response of the three receptor or cone cell types and thus have the same balance of long, middle and short wavelength components from the point of view of the human visual system. Such stimuli are called metameric and we'll see a little later that a set of the tristimulus values mentioned in this definition is a measure of this balance. For example, White, as a colour of light, is the way in which we perceive an even balance of the three components, like that of daylight. These graphs show the spectral power distributions of five matching white lights. The smooth distribution of a CIE daylight illuminant called D50, spiky distributions of two matching CIE fluorescent illuminants F8 and F10, and examples of distributions of CRT and LED screens adjusted to approximately match D50. Despite their finer grain differences, all of these lights match in appearance because they effectively have the same overall balance of the three wavelength components. Newton recognised that colours in the object are the object's disposition to reflect this or that sort of rays more copiously than the rest or what we would now call the object's intrinsic spectral reflectance. Newton observed the spectral reflectances of various artist pigments directly by shining a solar spectrum onto them in a darkened room. A colour that we perceive as belonging to an object is called an object colour. An object colour is the way in which we perceive the object's intrinsic spectral reflectance if the object is opaque, or its spectral transmission if the object is transparent. For brevity, I'll just say reflectance from here on. Once again, we now know that the perceivable property is not the spectral reflectance in all its detail, but its overall composition in terms of its long, middle and short wavelength components. When we can freely examine an object in daylight, the object colour we perceive it to have is a very good indication of the overall long, middle, short wavelength components of its spectral reflectance. This remains true to a point under coloured lighting, despite the different spectral distribution of the light the object reflects, due to the capacity of our visual system for a considerable degree of object colour constancy. In favourable viewing conditions, White as an object colour is the way in which we perceive a spectral reflectance whose long, middle and short wavelength components all approach the maximum possible. Black is the way in which we perceive a spectral reflectance in which these components are all very low. Various blue object colours are the ways in which we perceive various spectral reflectances that have an overall bias towards their short wavelength component. So things like red and green and white are ways in which we perceive a property of the spectral composition of a light or of the spectral reflectance of an object. This leads to the 64 million word question. Does the word colour properly refer to the perception, in this case white, or to the property that evokes that perception, 
in this case an even balance of long, middle and short wavelength components. Many scientists and some philosophers have taken the word colour to refer exclusively to the perception, leading them to make statements like colours do not exist, meaning that they exist only in the mind of the perceiver. Some other philosophers have applied the word colour to the property that disposes a light or an object to appear red, white, etc., or even to individual physical spectral distributions or reflectances. By these views, things like red and white and green become not colours as such, but only the ways in which these colour properties in lights and objects appear to us. The CIE International Lighting Vocabulary acknowledges two senses of the word colour and provides formal definitions of both. Perceived colour is defined as the characteristic of visual perception that can be described by attributes of hue, brightness or lightness and colourfulness or saturation or chroma. White and various reds and greens are examples of perceived colours. Note that in CIE terminology, hue, brightness, lightness, colourfulness, chroma and saturation are all defined as attributes of visual perception, not physical properties of lights or objects. A psychophysical colour is defined as a specification of a colour stimulus in terms of operationally defined values such as three tristimulus values. And tristimulus values are in turn defined as the amounts of the three reference colour stimuli in a given trichromatic system required to match the colour of the stimulus considered. A psychophysical colour is the measurable property that we use to specify the colour of a light or an object. In Newton's terms, perceived colour is colour in the sensorium or mind, while psychophysical colour specifies colour in the rays or in the object, that is, their power and disposition to stir up this or that sensation of colour. To understand the concepts of psychophysical colour and tristimulus values, consider your computer screen, which is after all a device for generating light with varying long wavelength, or R, middle wavelength, or G, and short wavelength, or B, components. Imagine viewing your computer screen alongside various areas of your room and matching the light coming from each area by adjusting the amounts of the R, G and B lights on your screen. If your screen was dark enough and you could turn up the lights high enough, you could in this way specify the colour of the light from most areas you see using a set of tristimulus values consisting of the amounts of the R, G and B lights on your screen that matched it, and plot these amounts as a three-dimensional cubic colour space, a procedure not unlike what your digital camera does for you automatically. You could also plot the ratios of these three tristimulus values as a two-dimensional diagram, a triangle. This two-dimensional diagram would show the balance or the ratios of the long, middle and short wavelength components independent of the total amount of light. Most lights you see could be plotted in these ways, apart from some highly saturated lights, including the monochromatic lights of the spectrum, that would lie outside the cube and outside the triangle. A chromaticity diagram is a two-dimensional diagram that, like our RGB triangle, shows the ratios of three tristimulus values independent of the total amount of light. The CIE 1931XY chromaticity diagram is not the latest but is still the most familiar descendant of Newton's colour circle. You might possibly have encountered one of these diagrams in a technical review comparing the range of colours obtainable on different RGB screens or contained in different RGB colour spaces as different triangles. The XY chromaticity diagram and a three-dimensional colour space called CIE XYZ use three purely theoretical primaries, X, Y, and Z, that lie outside the range of actual lights in order to specify all such lights. 
In the XY diagram, the colours of the monochromatic lights of the spectrum follow a horseshoe-shaped line, and mixtures of the extreme ends of the spectrum follow a straight line called the purple line. All actual lights can be matched to points in, in the area enclosed by these lines. These three values do not directly correspond to the amounts of the three wavelength components in a light, but it's nevertheless true that lights with high X values are high in long wavelengths, lights with high Y values are high in middle wavelengths, and lights with high Z values are high in short wavelengths, and that an isolated light in which X, Y and Z are about equal will appear white to most observers. As colour vision varies between different observers, calculation of CIE, X, Y and Z involves a mathematically defined standard human observer. Each point on the X, Y diagram represents a particular ratio of the X, Y and Z tristimulus values and specifies a particular balance of long, medium and short wavelength components as perceived by the standard human observer. Lights having the same X, Y, Z values would match exactly to this observer, although the perceived colour of these matching or metameric lights would vary depending on factors including the surrounding areas. The CIE term for Newton's concept of the direction of imbalance in the common centre of gravity of the number of rays, the direction OY in his circle, is dominant wavelength. Dominant wavelength is the measurable psychophysical property related to the perceived colour attribute of hue. A common misconception is that hue is an intrinsically linear scale corresponding to the wavelengths of the spectrum and is only arbitrarily bent and joined at the ends to form a hue circle or colour wheel. This is incorrect. Hue is our perception not of wavelength but of dominant wavelength, which has a 360 degree range to include directions of imbalance towards long, middle, short and long and short wavelengths. The CIE term for Newton's concept of the amount of imbalance in the common centre of gravity of the number of rays, the distance OZ in his circle, is purity which can be formulated in a couple of different ways as colorimetric purity or excitation purity. Purity is the measurable psychophysical property related to the perceived color attribute of saturation. We'll see in a later video that there are also psychophysical measures called luminance and luminous reflectance that relate to the perceived color attributes of brightness and lightness or grayscale value. Colours can be specified psychophysically in various ways, including tristimulus values, such as CIE, XYZ, as sets of three psychophysical measures, such as dominant wavelength, purity and luminance, or by a combination of chromaticity and luminance using a space called CIE, XY, Y. CIE, XY, Y can be used to specify the colour of an object in terms of the chromaticity and the relative luminance or amount of light that the object reflects under a specified daylight or luminant and can also be used to represent digital colour spaces. It will help to understand the difference between perceived colour and psychophysical colour if we consider contrast phenomena. Contrast phenomena demonstrate that our colour perceptions do not depend entirely on the spectral distribution of a stimulus, but are influenced by surrounding areas. Contrast phenomena are disconcerting to the so-called common sense view of colour, that colours are properties of lights and objects that our visual system simply detects. In this example, our visual system creates two different perceived colours from squares that match physically and have the same psychophysical colour specification, R180, G108, B108, one of the 16.7 million colours produced on an RGB screen. In CIE terminology, the same psychophysical colour evokes two different perceived colours. 
Science necessarily distinguishes between colour as a perception and the measurable property of a stimulus that we use to specify its colour, because the perceived colour of a given stimulus can vary not only with the surrounding areas, but also with such factors as lighting, how long the observer views the stimulus and what they have viewed previously, and on the individual characteristics of the visual system and even the attitude of the observer. If you concentrate your attention alternately first on the vertical and then on the horizontal elements of this pattern, you may notice that the perceived colours that your visual system creates alternate between vertical reddish and greenish stripes and horizontal bluish and olive stripes. Now stare steadily at the black dot in the centre of the pattern. If you're able to keep your eyes very still for long enough, you may notice the perceived colours starting to fade to grey, at least momentarily. Your perception of the amount of imbalance diminishes due to adaptation. In any case, if you've been focusing steadily on the black dot, you're probably now perceiving faint coloured afterimages. When we see coloured afterimages, we have a perception of an imbalance that does not exist physically in the spectral distribution of the stimulus, again due to adaptation. And you may again discover that you can change the afterimage colours you perceive by concentrating alternately on the vertical and the horizontal elements. As you continue to look, however, and adapt to the physically uniform screen, these afterimage colours gradually fade and your visual system will eventually create a uniform white perceived colour. But take this screen into a candlelit room and the perceived colour might be distinctly bluish. Take it outside into sunlight and the perceived colour might be dark grey. To sum up, when we perceive a light or an object to be red or white or green in colour, we have the impression that this colour is an intrinsic property residing in the light or object. And for many purposes, it's perfectly reasonable to speak of the light or object as being red or green or white coloured. As Newton found, this is a lot more convenient than constantly speaking of red making and green making wavelengths and so on. We should bear in mind, however, that this is speaking not philosophically and properly, but grossly, and is potentially misleading for two reasons. Firstly, scientific consensus is that the red or white or green colour does not reside in the light or the object, but is the way in which we perceive the spectral composition of the light or the spectral reflectance of the object. Further, the perceivable property of a spectral distribution is not its precise physical wavelength composition, but is a psychophysical property depending in part on the visual system of the observer. For a trichromatic observer, this psychophysical property perceived as colour involves the overall amounts of the long, middle and short wavelength components of the distribution. Red and green are the ways in which we perceive an overall imbalance towards different parts of the spectrum. White as a colour of light is the way in which we perceive an overall even balance of the spectral composition. White as an object colour is the way in which we normally perceive a spectral reflectance that is both evenly balanced and very high. Secondly, the perceived colour of a given light or object is not as absolute as it may seem and is influenced by factors relating to the viewing environment and the individual. When we measure the colour of a light or object using colorimetry, we are using the word colour in a specific sense, psychophysical colour, that captures the disposition of the light or object to appear a certain colour to a mathematically defined standard human observer. A psychophysical colour specification of, say, an RGB screen stimulus predicts what the stimulus will match. It does not equate to a unique, true, perceived colour and can only be converted to a set of perceived colour attributes if the viewing conditions are specified. For example, it can be converted to a set of perceived colour attributes in the Munsell or NCS system using tables that assume specified viewing conditions or by using a colour appearance model to predict its appearance under various other viewing conditions. 
In the next video, I'll look at what is and isn't known about how our visual system generates perceptions of hue and colour intensity, and see how the so-called common sense assumption that hues like red and blue reside and mix in paints, inks and lights has led to various beliefs about supposedly fundamental components of colour called primary colours.